A blessed Lord's Day, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our online Sunday worship service. We are again privileged by the Lord to hear His word today. And God is so good for uh, having blessed also our face-to-face -face gathering this morning. And we also thank the Lord for the opportunity to hear His word for uh, those of us who were able to attend the online worship service of uh, our church in Bayambang. Thank you for being able to become part of the service also at our Bayambang Outreach. Brothers and sisters, today we will be looking at a new series here in our Sunday service. And this series, we have already started this last year. It is uh, a book study on the book of Ephesians, the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. But before we hear the word of the Lord, let's first uh, come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for another opportunity, Lord, to hear your word today. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace that sustains and upholds all of us, O Lord, to continue to run the race, O God, with endurance and with perseverance, with the power, O Lord God, that comes from you. Father in heaven, we also commit to you, Lord, the hearing of your word, O Lord, Father in heaven, right now that your spirit, Lord, will continue to move in our hearts. I pray, Father in heaven, for your blessed anointing. I pray, Father God, for your empowering, Lord, your enabling upon your servant, Father in heaven, that, Lord, I might be able to deliver your word, O Lord God, according to your will and with the wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will bless your word and please bless all the viewers, O oh Lord God, who will be able, O oh Lord, to watch, O oh Lord, this video sermon. Maraming marami pong salamat, Panginoon. And grant us, Lord, your Lord, your blessing as we start a new series, Lord, here, Lord God, at our online Sunday worship service, Father God. Marami pong salamat, Panginoon. We give you praise, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As you all know, we already took up chapter 1 of Ephesians last year at our online prayer watch. We took that up when uh, we were still under ECQ, I think. And we took up uh, the whole chapter of Ephesians. So if you would like to review the teachings on chapter 1, please simply go to our uh, YouTube or Facebook page. However, those teachings were more of the devotional type, okay? Hindi po sila uh, expository type of preaching that we usually have on Sundays, okay? So, today we will be picking up from where we left off. So, we will begin our series starting this Sunday on Ephesians on the second chapter, Okay? So although we will only take up one verse today, we will read the whole paragraph from verses 1 to 10. So let me read to you Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast." 
For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Brothers and sisters, our title for today's sermon is Man's Sinful State. And it is taken from this passage that we read. You know, brethren, when the Bible was written, there were no chapters, there were no verse divisions. These were just added later on for better study and uh, remembrance. That is why when you read verse 1 of chapter 2, this is just a continuation of everything that Paul wrote in chapter 1. That is why verse 1 starts with, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, for us to have an, in, an accurate interpretation and a spirit-filled study and application of the Word of God, we need to keep in mind what was Paul's key idea, okay? What was the intention or what was the general argument of the author on why he wrote the letter to the Ephesians? Because all the details, okay, everything else that we would be reading in the whole letter to the Ephesians would be hinged on these things, okay? To study a text, we have to begin with a question, what does the author mean, okay? We do not read a letter in the middle of it, okay? We have to read a letter from the very start so we would know the context, okay? So we would know the heart of the letter writer. Why do we do this when we study God's Word? We do this so that the Holy Spirit will have the freedom to bless God's Word when we preach it faithfully and purely. If we know the context, okay, the background, you know it would be easier for us to apply what the Bible says to our current situations. Bible teachers say that Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 is the Bible's key text when it comes to the doctrine of sin. And the question is, why is the doctrine of sin, the teaching, here in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians? Okay, so why is the doctrine of sin written in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians? Another thing that we need to remind ourselves of, uh, based on our study last year, is that of all the letters of Paul, this is the only letter wherein Paul was not refuting any false teaching. There was really no conflict or any church division that he was dealing with, perhaps because this letter was not just addressed to one particular church, but it was, it was really meant to be a letter for the churches in Asia Minor, of which Ephesus was the capital or the chief city. So it wasn't just meant for one local church, but it was meant for many churches, okay? If you remember, the book of Ephesians is a panoramic view of our salvation. And we know what panoramic means, okay? A panorama is when you take a shot or a picture of a view and you just, you just don't take a certain portion, okay? But you are going to look at the full picture of the view as you see it with your own eyes, okay? So you really need a very wide lens for that so that you can appreciate the whole view. So Ephesians is a panoramic view, a full picture of our salvation. It talks about how God's people had been chosen by God before time began. So Paul's detailed explanation of our sinfulness, okay, our sinfulness is necessary for us to see the full picture of our salvation. You see, brethren, we cannot really measure the height of a building when we don't start from the bottom of the ground, correct? We must know the bottom, therefore, of the pit where God took us from so that we might 
all the more gain a better understanding, a better appreciation of our great and glorious salvation as Christians. So again, what did Paul try to communicate in chapter 1 that led to chapter 2? What is the general theme of the letter of Paul? I greatly benefited from D.M. Lloyd-Jones' study on his introduction to Ephesians chapter 2 in understanding Paul means thought. First, the theme of Ephesians, its very theme verse could be found in chapter 1 of verse 10. It says, To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That the goal of God for the universe, all things in heaven and on earth, is to unite all things under Christ. Okay? To unite all things under Christ, that everything is going to be under the kingship or the rulership of our Lord Jesus. You know, brethren, when we look at our world today, we do not see unity, correct? What we see is disorder. What we see is chaos, decay, corruption, rebellion. What we see is this pandemic that we are going through. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, tells us that God's plan is to unite all things in Christ. And this plan started, you know when? Even before God created time. Even before the foundation of the world. And how did it happen? God chose the church to be perfect in His eyes. And God predestined the believers for adoption into his family. This is God's grand plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth. And this began even before the foundation of the world. And even before the foundation of the world, the Lord has already chosen the believers. He has already chosen his church to be holy and to be perfect in his eyes. It says in Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 5, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, God the Father accomplished this plan through our Lord Jesus. Without the Lord redeeming us from our sins, we will never be pardoned and reconciled to God. Because as you know, we are in a big problem. And that problem is that man is sinful. That is our condition. So how did the Lord accomplish our redemption? Okay, how did the Lord accomplish our redemption? It, is, it was by His death. Okay, it was by His death. It is by Christ's blood that we are united to God, reconciled, forgiven, pardoned, adopted, and had become heirs of an, in, an eternal inheritance. All of these blessings... All of these blessings of being forgiven, redeemed, adopted have come to the believers because of the saving work of Christ on the cross. And to guarantee our redemption and inheritance, God marked us with a seal. He marked us with a seal and like an earnest money, God deposited in us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us which makes our redemption unbreakable, eternal, secure, which makes our salvation, our redemption irreversible, all right? The Holy Spirit is the proof that we are God's possession forever and ever. Amen po? Now, our salvation has one overall goal, okay? And it is all for the praise of of the glory of God's grace. In Ephesians 1.12, it says, In order that we, 
who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. So the ultimate goal, brethren, of our salvation, of our redemption, is not really about us. It's really about the glory of God. Okay? It's really about the glory of God. And when God shows us His mercy, when God shows us His grace, it brings glory to His name. And at the same time, we are the ones who are the recipients. We are the ones who benefit from all the good things and all the wonderful attributes, the beautiful qualities and character of our God. We are the recipients of His grace. Now, from verses 15 to 23 of chapter 1, given this grand plan of God for the universe and our salvation, Paul tells the Ephesians how he prays for them. He prays for their enlightenment through the Holy Spirit's wisdom and revelation. He prays that they might know the hope of their calling and the riches of their inheritance. Above all, Paul prays that they may know about God's great power that God has exerted when God raised Jesus from the dead and have made Christ head over everything for the sake of the church, which is his body. So this is the all-consuming uh, desire of Paul when he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. God revealed to Paul this panoramic view of our salvation and God's intention for the whole universe. And Paul was just so elated by these revelations. And he was praying to God in his heart that the Lord would also give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we might know all of these things that God has called us. The hope of our calling the inheritance of the saints and the power, the great power that works in us who believe in God. Amen? And it is that power that raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead that is at work in us as believers. So this is the main background of Ephesians. Sabi nga po ni D.M. Lloyd-Jones, there is this unseen history which is at the back of the visible history, and which is much more important. There is the spiritual history which, as it were, underlies all secular history, in, and in the light of which secular history becomes relatively unimportant. Brothers and sisters, we see our world right now in chaos, in disunity, with a lot of problems, with much evil and suffering left and right. But the Word of God always reminds us that God is in perfect control. Amen? And that God has a plan and that God is actively accomplishing and fulfilling His purpose even from eternal past, even at, up to this very moment, even in our hearts, in our salvation, we see that God is fulfilling every tiny detail of his eternal plan and purpose. That is why we should not only look at this world as if this is the only life that we're going to have. We need to have a heavenly mindset. The Bible tells us that we should always seek the things of heaven and not the things of this world because the things of this world which are seen are actually temporary. But the things that are unseen, the things that we do not see, these are the things that are really going to be eternal. Amen? So this is the background of chapter 1. It's about the greatness of our salvation and the glory of it. Given this prayer of Paul in verses 17 to 19, it is his desire, that is why Paul will take pains in explaining a lot of matters when we reach chapter 2. Alright? Since gusto po ni Paul na is niya po na makita po ng mga efficient believers yung 
greatness ng kanilang kaligtasan, yung panoramic view ng atin pong salvation, mga kapatid. So, He will take pains to make us understand, okay? To make us understand where we came from, okay? He will try to make us understand what is the state and condition of man prior to our salvation. So, now let's look at chapter 2 again. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. In these three verses, the Apostle Paul presents a total picture of the biblical doctrine of sin, okay? Or the scriptural view of man. Brethren, when we look at man, okay, ano po ba yung iniisip natin patungkol po sa tao? Di po ba iniisip natin, saan ba tayo nang galing? Bakit ba tayo nandito? And sino ba tayo? No? Who are we? Here in these three verses, there are three questions that will be answered, and we will look at this in the next Sundays starting now. The first is the question, what is the state of man in verse 1? The second is, who rules man Okay, in verses 2 and 3? And the third question is, how does God see man? Okay, so that is in verse 3 also, the, la the latter part. The first question, as I've said, we will only look at verse 1 today, is what is the state of man? Okay, what is his condition? The prevailing concept that a vast majority of people believe in the world today is that man is inherently good. Correct? Ito po ang ating uh, mapapanood, mababasa, makikita, no po, na ang tao ay sadyang mabait, sadyang mabuti. Okay? Ang tawag po roon ay humanism. Alright? Humanism. That given the right circumstances, education, environment, opportunities, men and women will choose to do good and as a result, perfect societies will appear, okay? So, of course, with this kind of idea or belief, what it, what it is also saying is that the badness of people can be blamed on external things, such as his environment, such as poverty, or his lack of education, that the reason man is bad probably it is, has something to do with how he was raised up and all of these things. So, this world will never, will never attribute the evil things that man does to the issue of sin. But it will always try to explain a way why man is evil or why man does bad things, okay? But the exact opposite is taking place in the world today. We all know that. You know, brethren, in the United States, it was reported last June, okay, last June, that at a certain day, there was four mass shootings that took place in four different states in just a matter of six hours, okay? In just a matter of six hours, four mass shootings took place in four different states. Of course, many people died, Many people were injured, which tells us that men are not getting any better. In fact, this world is getting more and more chaotic. As we've studied two Sundays ago, the world will go into complete moral decay if not for the church and for the influence of the gospel as a restraining force okay, against wickedness. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says here, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The word dead here is the Greek word necros, from which we get the English word necropsy, or the examination of a dead body, 
or necrology meaning obituary okay it's what you find in the newspapers okay with a list of the people who died so literally when the bible says and you were dead in your trespasses and sins what the bible is saying literally is that and you were a dead corpse okay you were a dead person you were a corpse okay in your trespasses and sins meaning you are spiritually okay spiritually dead the apostle paul is telling the christians of ephesus that they were once dead dead in what sense dead in their trespasses and sins which means the state and the miserable condition the woeful condition of every person in this world is that he is a spiritual corpse okay he is a spiritual corpse many of us have seen movies about zombies men who've died and who rose from the grave not because they were resurrected but they are living dead and they walk around and they scare people so these are horror stories now when you really try to look at our situation spiritually we are living persons but we are living dead persons because physically we are alive although eventually we would all die but spiritually we are not alive we are spiritually dead so this is the state and the condition of every human being in this world this is the woeful state of all people in this world all right without christ every person in this world is, is spiritually dead now we cannot say that a person is half dead you cannot also say that a person is almost dead you are either breathing and alive or you are dead okay you are dead it is absolute no it is absolute once you pronounce that a person is dead there are no qualifiers it means the person has no life and this is man's true spiritual state patay ang isang tao okay patay po siya he is dead he has no spiritual life was this state of being a spiritual corpse something that happened only for a brief period of time? No, because in the Bible it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The word were means that before the efficient Christians became believers, being spiritually dead was their continual state ever since they were born into this world. Okay? Now, what could be the reason for man's spiritual death? It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Man is in a state of spiritual death because of his trespasses and sins. Now, let us try to uh, explain what these two words are. Trespasses is the Greek word paraptoma. It means to fall aside or to slip it means taking a false step that leads a person to stumble or to fall na mali kayo ng hakbang na mali ka ng lakad ano po so that's paraptoma when you trespass what happens is you leave the path that is right the leave the path that is true you deviate from what is from what is correct okay so there's a straight road okay there's a straight road but there is a false step no you took a false step and that caused you to deviate from the right road okay trespass is also translated as transgressions and they mean the same thing it means to cross the line or to overstep a limit or a boundary yun po ang ibig sabihin ano so when we illegally enter someone else's place we know the word to use is trespass pag 
ikaw ay pumasok sa bahay ng iba na hindi mo naman yun pamamahay, ang tawag doon ay trespassing. No? You crossed the boundaries. No? You crossed the line. All right? You crossed the line. You're not supposed to go into that place, go into that house, but you crossed the line. Okay? So, that's called trespassing. And similarly, when we trespass, when we transgress, the line that we're crossing is God's law. Okay? That's the line that we're crossing. We are crossing God's holiness. We're crossing His righteousness. We are crossing His being God. All right? It means we challenge the boundaries of the laws that God has set. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, it gives an additional light to the meaning of trespass. It means to go beyond one's rightful place, to endure, to annoy, to inconvenience. Okay? And this is what happens when we trespass. We go out of our rightful place as creatures, and what we do is we injure or we offend our creator. All right? We injure or we offend someone, and that someone, brethren, is our God. What about sin? Sin or hamartia in Greek originally had the idea of missing mark as when hunting with a bow and an arrow. All right? So, it is missing a mark when hunting with a bow and arrow. Later, it came to mean missing or falling short of any goal, standard, or purpose. And brethren, we all know that none of us is perfect. We make mistakes. We err. We, we, we do not always do the right thing, okay? In fact, we have so many shortcomings. We have many blunders. We have many, many weaknesses, in short, we are full of errors in our lives, okay? We are full of mistakes. And we may call it those things, but it's actually sin. This is what sin means. We never hit the bull's eye of God's perfect standard. So, kumbaga po dun sa sports ng, ano po, ng, ng darts, okay? Wherein there is a center hole, okay? Or a uh, center in that huge circle. Pag tayo po, we are trying to hit that bull's eye, but instead of hitting the bull's eye or even ne just near around the bull's eye, we sinners we don't even hit. We don't even hit the nearby perimeter, okay? But our darts go everywhere. All right, our darts go everywhere, which means we really miss the mark of God's intended plan, His intended purpose. We really miss God's perfect and righteous standard. So when we trespass, ano po yung kaibahan ng dalawa, no? When we trespass, what we do is we offend God by crossing the line. But when we sin, we miss hitting God's perfect standard of righteousness. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that is a description of sin. It is falling short of the glory of God. It's anything, sin is anything that we say, do, think, imagine. It's about inclinations or plans which fail to meet God's perfect standard. It is missing the mark of the glory of God. Now, going back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it also says there, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This means that we are not dead because we committed one or two sins, all right? Man is dead because he is in the domain or the realm of sin. We commit sin because we were born sinners, mga kapatid. Ano po? It is like a fish that swims in an aquarium or in an ocean, meaning 
it is immersed in water and that is the same thing that's true about us we are immersed in our sinfulness in psalm 51 verse 5 surely i was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me so even if a newborn is so cute and cuddly and yet spiritually that newborn is, is spiritually dead because that child has been born in sin, okay? He or she was sinful at birth, sinful from the time that we've been conceived by our mothers. Napakalalim po mga kapatid ng kasalanan sa atin pong mga buhay na nandun pa lamang po tayo sa sinapupunan ng ating mga magulang, okay? We are already sinful from the very time that our mothers conceived us. Matthew 15 verse 19 says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. To say it another way, we're not evil because we do evil. We do evil because we are evil. In Romans 3, it says, What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, brethren, maybe you would say, but I am not that evil. I am not that bad, okay? You know, when you try to imagine a battlefield, all right, and you see a lot of soldiers who died on that battlefield, and some of those dead bodies have been there probably for weeks or several days but some of them just died okay now the state of decomposition varies from one corpse to another but all of those dead bodies have one thing in common they're all dead maaring iba-iba lamang sila nung stage of decomposition pero lahat po nung mga patay na yon ay patay and that is the same thing brothers and sisters with man Maybe one person is respectable, decent, and all those things. So you don't see the decay morally, okay? But it doesn't matter that person is, is spiritually dead, okay? And maybe you see another person who is a gross sinner. Maybe a person who, who murders others, who rapes, who robs, who kills, and everything. And in a state of decomposition, that person is really, really decaying morally. But it doesn't make him any worse than the decent or the respectable guy when it comes to being dead in sins and trespasses. All of us, brothers and sisters, regardless of our education, regardless of our background, our race, our ethnicity etc etc when we were born in this world we were born spiritually dead okay as one person said a person doesn't become a liar because he lies he lies because he is already a liar a person doesn't become a murderer because he kills he kills because there is already murder in his heart a person does not become a thief because he steals. He steals because he is a thief already in his heart. And the same is true for any other sin that we can think of. People don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. The outward manifestations of human sin always are a reflection of our hearts. Because sinning is basic to our nature. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Siguro, iisipin po natin, bakit ako nagkaganito? No? Sino may kagagawa nito? San ko nakuha itong kasalanan na ito? It says here, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, 
and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. What happened, brothers and sisters, is that we inherited Adam's sinful nature. All right? Minana po natin yun pong sinful nature po ni Adan. And that is why we sin. Okay? It means we are as much guilty as Adam was because even if we inherited that sinful nature, we cannot say that we are off the hook, okay? Because we sin, and that makes us as guilty, guilty as Adam was. And because the wages of sin is death, it says here in Romans 5.12 that death came to all people because all sinned. That is why Ephesians 2 verse 1 says that, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what are the characteristics of a dead person? All right? Of course, we are going to look at the physical and compare it with the spiritual. Now, a dead person has no life. Okay? And same is true. Same thing is true with being spiritually dead. A spiritually dead person is devoid of all his spiritual life. Okay? When a person dies, a person is unable to respond to any impulse or stimuli. No? Ang ibig sabihin po nun, kapag ang tao po, patay na po siya, yung pong tao na yan, kahit suntukin mo siya, di yan aaray. Alright? Kahit na sigawan mo, hindi siya sisigaw ulit sa'yo. Okay? Kahit na painumin mo siya, ng, paamuin mo siya ng pagkain, hindi siya no ma-attract dun sa pagkain na yon bakit kasi patay na po siya eh, no when a person dies that body is already an inanimate object okay inanimate meaning wala na yung buhay hindi na yan gumagalaw all right so hindi yan nagsasalita wala na siyang life it possesses no ability to hear, to see, to think, to respond because it has no life. It's already an inanimate object. The touch that used to thrill them no longer elicit a response. The voice that were so familiar, the voices that were so familiar can no longer be heard. I don't know if this is an actual story, but there was once a person, this is quite morbid, no? Na namatay po yung kanya pong uh, di ko po alam kung asawa niya yon or mother niya. And because this woman wouldn't believe that her loved one already parted, what she did was uh, she made her loved one, which is of course the corpse, she propped her loved one, maybe her husband, she propped him on a rocking chair, okay? And of course, that body started to decompose and everything, but she was hoping that she would, he would still come back to life, all right? And it never happened, no? Because that person is already dead, no? There is no longer uh, the soul in that body, okay? And that person is already a corpse, and it is already decomposing, the eyes that once marveled at the beauty of this world can no longer see. Kaya di po ba ang sakit-sakit kapag po namatayan tayo ng mahal sa buhay? No? Kasi wala na siya. No? Kahit makita mo yung kanyang bangkay, wala nang buhay. No? Para na lamang po itong, yun na nga po, it's an inanimate object. It's just a shell. Okay? It's just a shell. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, it says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is, is His Son, is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Okay? Being devoid of spiritual life, a spiritually dead person is ignorant of spiritual life and spiritual things. Okay? Being devoid of spiritual life, a spiritually dead person is ignorant of spiritual life and spiritual things. It, in other words, hindi ito magme-make sense sa kanya kasi patay nga siya eh, no? So, yung mga spiritual stuff, okay, nung hindi pa po tayo Christian, wala po itong 
dating sa atin, no? hindi po tayo naiinganyo sa mga bagay na spiritual. The dead find spiritual truth boring. God's word hold no in, holds no interest for the lost. They're not bored with worldly things. In fact, they enjoy worldly things because these appeal to the flesh. And Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says that those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Let me read to you what D.M. Lloyd-Jones said. The man who's not a Christian finds the Bible very boring. And expositions of the, vibe of the Bible very boring. He does not find films boring. He does not find newspapers boring. He does not find novels boring. But he finds the Bible and the things of God boring. Why? Because he has no life. He has no spiritual life. He does not enjoy conversations about the soul, about life and death, heaven and God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He cannot help it, but he just sees nothing in it, and he is not interested. He is interested in men, their appearance, what they've done, what they've said, the world, its affairs. These are the things that appeal to him tremendously. The position is perfectly simple. These other things are spiritual. They are God's things, and that kind of man sees nothing in them. Why? Because he is dead. He has no his spiritual life. Now let's go to the last and second the second and the last point. The second characteristic of a spiritually dead person is that they have no ability to respond, okay, to God. They have no ability to respond to God. In 1 Corinthians 2:14, it says, "The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and can't understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So ang tao po na wala pong Espiritu ng Diyos sa Kanya, ang mga bagay po ng Diyos para po sa Kanya ay isa lamang pong kalokohan. Ano po? Hindi niya po ito maintindihan. Alright? Hindi niya po ito maintindihan. When a physical body dies, it loses ability to respond to the physical world, okay? And in a spiritual sense, it's the same thing. It is the perfect illustration of those who don't know the Lord. Allow me to read to you some uh, portions from Warren Wearsby's commentary. Sabi niya, just as a person physically dead does not respond to physical stimuli, so a person spiritually dead is unable to respond to spiritual things. A corpse does not hear the conversation going on in the funeral parlor. Alam niyo po, kahit pag-usapan mo yung patay, kasasabihin mo sa kanya, Uy, baka naririnig ka nung patay. No? Hindi ka na maririnig nun kasi patay na yun. Eh. Diba? Kahit na pinag-uusapan ninyo yung namatay. Di po ba? Kasi wala na po. Eh. Patay na siya. Eh. At spiritually, ganun din po. No? He has no appetite for food or drink. He feels no pain. He is dead. So a spiritually dead person does not have a conviction, especially when it comes to sin. All right? He or she may feel a prick in his conscience, okay? And he or she may feel guilty, but there is no conviction coming from the Holy Spirit that he committed sin to God, okay? He has offended God when he sinned. Wala po yung conviction po na yon na magsisi po sa kanyang kasalanan, ano? Dahil spiritually, wala niya, hindi niya po ito nararamdaman, yun pong conviction na nanggagaling po sa banal na spirito. Just so with the inner man of the unsaved person, his spiritual faculties are not functioning and they cannot function until God gives him life. That is why Warren Wiersbe said, the unbeliever is not sick, he is dead. Okay? The unbeliever is not sick. He is dead. We are not sick with COVID-19. Alright? We are not sick with cancer or tuberculosis or whatever. Spiritually, there is no cure for our, for our state as sinful men and women. 
who are dead in our trespasses and sins. He does not need resuscitation. What he needs is resurrection. All lost sinners are dead, and the only difference between one sinner and another is the state of decay. Okay? So, anong kailangan po ng isang tao? Hindi po rehab. Hindi po bagong relihiyon. Ang kailangan niya po ay buhay. Ano? Ang kailangan niya po ay resurrection. This means that dead men will never be able to have any power to do in their own strength to create new life in their spirits. Okay? This is the reason why Paul had to say this to the Ephesian believers so that they would know that if not for God's grace, if not for God's mercy, if not for God's grace making us alive, okay? Making us alive, making us hear the voice of the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, we will remain spiritually dead, okay? Because we will not respond to the things of God. So brothers and sisters, as we close today's message, okay? As we close this Sunday's message, if you are already a believer in the Lord, just as Paul was asking God for God to reveal his enlightenment, his spirit of wisdom and revelation upon the believers. May this cause our hearts to really rejoice in the grace of God. Amen? May this really cause our hearts to be in awe of the power of God that raised us from the dead, that made us alive in Christ. May this teaching that we, have, we were dead in our sins and trespasses May it really humble our hearts that within, within our own strength, we never had the power to come to God. We never had the power within ourselves to respond to the Lord, to respond to the gospel. And yet, by the grace of God, He made us alive. Amen? By the grace of God, through the work of the gospel, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, Brothers and sisters, the reason we gave our lives to the Lord, okay? We heard the gospel and we responded. And that response in itself is still the grace of God upon our lives. It's the mercy of the Lord upon our lives. And this is what Paul was praying for, okay? This is what Paul is, was praying for, that we might know the hope of our calling, our inheritance, and we might know the power that is at work in us who believe, and it is that power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So brothers and sisters, have you been brought back from the dead? You are, are you already a Christian? And if you're already a Christian, this is another opportunity for us to rejoice and be glad about our salvation because once we were dead, once we were ignorant, once we were like an inanimate object spiritually, but now we can already feel God's love. Now we can respond to the Lord. Now we can love Him back. Now we can, we can appreciate the grace of the Lord. Now we can study and Meditate upon the Lord. Now we can already be filled with the Spirit of God and be filled with life each day and know the Lord deeper and deeper. And that is because the Lord has made us alive. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verses 3, and following, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Ang sabi po ng Panginoon, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. This is why we need to be born again. We need to have a spiritual birth. Now, brothers and sisters, this message also has something to do with our loved ones, our friends, our co-workers who are still unbelievers. We see them every day and we know that they are spiritually dead. And we know that even if we keep telling them about the gospel that Jesus Christ died for their sins, if the Holy Spirit 
will not regenerate them if the Holy Spirit will not breathe His life upon these people, they will not be saved. And that is why we need to pray, okay? We need to really cry out to the Lord to be merciful and to save more lost souls into His kingdom and bring them back into His kingdom. Take them out of darkness into His marvelous light. Kailangan po nating Manalangin pa po ng manalangin ng manalangin sa Panginoon dahil marami pa po ang wala ang Panginoon sa kanilang mga puso at sila po ay nananatili na mga bangkay sa kanila pong mga spiritual na buhay. Now, lastly, have you been brought back from the dead? Now, this question is addressed probably to several who are watching and we can identify with the characteristics of a spiritually dead person. We are ignorant of the things of God, and the things of God bore us. But now we are hearing the voice of the Lord, and now there is that invitation of God upon our hearts. In John chapter 5, verses 24 to 25, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Maybe you will ask yourself, how can I have life? What can save me from this spiritual deadness? What can bring me back to life since I am a spiritual corpse? Ano ang makakapagbigay sa akin ng buhay? The Bible says, Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. The only person who can bring back life to a spiritually dead man, to men and women, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Lord Jesus has the power to set us free from our enslavement, from our bondage, in sin, from our being dead, only the Lord has the power to resurrect us, to give us new life. And how do we do that? It says here, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. If you are still spiritually dead, coming to Christ in faith and repentance is the only way that you can become is spiritually alive. Only Christ has the power to raise your soul from the dead and breathe life into you. Christ will do it because he promised it. He invites you to let Him into your heart if you will only believe Him wholeheartedly. He will not reject you. He will receive you and He will breathe new life into you. He will give you a new heart and make you into a new creature. Amen? Brothers and sisters, do you hear the voice of the Son of God speaking into your heart? It says in the Bible that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. I believe that it's not just those who are buried under the graves, but we who are spiritually dead, men and women who are spiritually dead, when we hear the voice of the Son of God, if we heed, if we respond, then brothers and sisters, the Son of God will give life to those who receive Him. Before we end in prayer, let us sing a song of worship to the Lord, reminding us that all that we have is Christ.
bow down our heads in prayer and come before the Lord. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us, Lord, this blessed Lord's Day. We thank you, Father God, for the series that we are now having here in the church, O God, on Ephesians. And today you've reminded us, Lord, through your word, Lord, of the deep pit that you have taken us from father you reminded us lord god of our lord our miserable and our woeful condition as sinners oh lord that we were dead in our trespasses and sins and that there was nobody lord who could really bring us back to life and father god we are rejoicing in our hearts, O Lord. Nagpapasalamat po kami, Panginoon, sa aming mga puso, pagkat kami po ay binigyan ninyo ng buhay sa pamamagitan po, Panginoon, ng salita ng Diyos, sa pamamagitan po ng ginawa ng aming Panginoong Jesus, ang Kanya pong pagbibigay ng Kanyang buhay sa Kanyang pagkamatay sa krus, O Lord God, ang Siyang naging daan upang kami, Panginoon, ay mabigyan ng buhay. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you will use your word, O God. You will use, O Lord, your 
scriptures you will use all of these messages O oh lord god so that we will really lord god have life in us your words lord they are life and whoever hears your words lord they have eternal life father god pinapanalangin namin ng mga yaon na hindi pa po nakakakilala sa aming panginoong jesus ang inyo lamang pong grace ang inyo lamang pong awa panginoon ang makakapagbigay po sa amin ng buhay ang makakapagbukas ng aming puso upang makilala namin si Jesus. At dinadalangin namin, Panginoon, na kung meron man po sa aming nakikinig sa mga sandaling ito na hindi pa po nakakakilala sa aming Panginoon, Lord, we pray that this person will really turn to Jesus Christ. And friend, if you heard this message and you would like to respond to the voice of the Son of God, who is calling you right now, Asking you to leave your life of sinfulness and to turn your back on this world and to turn your whole heart to Christ. Come to the Lord in prayer and I'd like to lead you in a short prayer. Say this from your heart, Father, I am a sinner. I am sinful from the time of my birth, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. Father God, I cannot earn my salvation. Only Jesus is my hope. Only Jesus is my salvation. And I pray that right now, you will accept me to be your child. You will help me turn back from sin. Oh Lord, turn away from this sinfulness lord and make me lord a new person i trust in jesus and put my whole heart my whole faith in what he has done for me in paying my sins paying for my sins on the cross i trust and believe in jesus christ as the savior my personal lord and my savior father god Accept me as your child. Make me the person that you want me to be. And may I bring glory and praise to your name forever and ever. In Jesus' name. Salamat po, Panginoon. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Father in heaven indeed, Lord, napaka-blessed po namin, Panginoon, na kami po, Panginoon, ay binuhay ninyo mula sa patay na kami po, Panginoon, ay binigyan ninyo ng bagong puso, bagong mga mata, tenga, o Diyos, na ngayon po, Panginoon, ay nakakarinig na po kami, nakakakita na po kami, na darama na po namin, Panginoon, ang inyo pong pag-ibig sa amin. Maraming marami pong salamat. Father God, we entrust to you, Lord, all our hearers, our viewers, O God, may your name, O Lord, continue to be Lifted and glorified in the lives of your people, O Lord. May this new life that you've given us, Lord, be manifested every day in our lives, Lord. May each one of us, Lord, continue to know you more, Father in heaven, and walk according to the path of righteousness. Again, we thank you, Lord, for you have saved us, Lord, from our trespasses and sins. And Lord, may we always be filled with gratitude for this great salvation, O Lord God, that you have given us. Lord, thank you. You have chosen us before the foundation of the world. Thank you, Lord God. There's, there was nothing, Lord God, that we could have done. But Lord, you've done this all by your grace, mercy, and love for us. Maraming marami pong salamat. And because of this, Lord, you alone deserve all glory and praise now and forevermore. Maraming marami pong salamat, Panginoon. We entrust you, Father God, your church. We entrust you, Lord, your ministry in Gospel of Grace, all our brethren. May we continue, Lord God, to be upheld by you, to be salt and light, Father God. And we pray that you will use us, Lord, to continue, Lord, to spread the message of salvation 
to more and more people. We also lift up to you, Lord, all the families, Lord God, and homes. We pray that our unsaved loved ones, Lord, will truly come to Christ and will truly know Jesus Christ. Salamat po, Panginoon. May your blessings, Lord, and gracious provisions, Lord, Father, be upon your people. Thank you, Father God, for everything. You are our life. You are our joy. You are the peace of our lives. You are our salvation now and forevermore. We give you thanks and praises. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. A blessed Lord's Day again, brothers and sisters. May the God of peace, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, may He equip all of us in doing everything according to His will. And may He also continue to work in us that which is pleasing in His eyes, all for the glory of His name. God bless you and see you again next Sunday here at our online Sunday worship service. Thank you.